Hello, um, welcome to another album review. Today I'm going to be reviewing Atom Heart Mother this, by Pink Floyd. Uh, this is uh, album review number 11. Uh, Atom Heart Mother uh, was released in 1970. It is Pink Floyd's fifth studio album. Fourth if you don't count the soundtrack albums, which I kind of don't. Um, I don't count, when I really think about studio albums, I don't count of any band. I don't count uh, soundtrack or cover albums really. So I'd say Pink Floyd have done 13 albums and two soundtrack albums, you know. Uh, Rush for example, a lot of people say they've done 20 albums. I'd say they've done 19. I wouldn't count Feedback because Feedback's just a cover album, you know. It is. It was recorded in the studio but unless it's original material I wouldn't really count it as a studio album. So I'd say they've done 19 albums and one cover album, Rush. So yeah. Anyway, uh, this was the Pink Floyd uh, album where they noticeably moved away from the more uh, psychedelic sound of the previous albums and moved to a more traditionally uh, traditionally uh, progressive sound. Um, of course, Pink Floyd have uh, pretty much always been progressive because uh, they've always been experimental. Um, so... Well, it depends on how you look at it, but uh, I would call, I'd call Atom Heart Mother the first proper prog album. I've heard that, um, from what I've heard, prog and progressive rock are two different things. I had no idea. I thought prog was just shorter for progressive rock. Uh, prog, I think, in terms of, this is more just fans' definitions, prog means 20-minute songs, the keyboard solos, the complex time signatures. Well, progressive rock means experimental stuff. So, yeah. So, I, I guess it's, it was their first prog album, but not their first progressive album, if you know what I mean. Um, they really should have a different name for, for the two of them. Uh, you know, people sometimes people call it symphonic rock, but not all prog rock's symphonic. So, that doesn't really work either. Um but uh, yeah, I don't have the vinyl. I've only got the um, the Discovery Edition, which is sort of like a mini vinyl. I sort of like that. It's paper, you know. It's, it's they're all um, uh, gatefold, sort of like wee ones. I assume that's what's on the inside. Uh, it's got the wee book in, in one side, and then the, the CD in the other. So it's sort of like you know bringing out the vinyl like that. Uh, so the only two albums that I don't have the Discovery albums. Uh, discovery versions of uh, are The Wall and Dark Side of the Moon because when I proper got into Pink Floyd in 2014 the only two albums that I'd heard before that any of were The Wall and Dark Side of the Moon so I, I bought the experience editions of those because I had experience with them and I was just discovering the other ones so I bought the discovery editions just a, me just having a bit of fun uh, though the experience editions only existed for three of them Dark Side of the Wall and Wish You Were Here so I couldn't get the Saucer Full of Secrets Experience Edition even if I wanted to because it doesn't exist. Um, but all the Discovery Editions were uh, released and uh, this, this is of course one of them. Uh, quickly talk about the album cover. Maybe I should start doing that. I don't. I really don't do that enough. Because um, the album cover is a very important part of the, the album. Uh, well it's a picture of a cow. Not really much, not really much to say about that. Uh, I guess it sort of fits uh, breast milky, funky dung, stuff like that. It's kind of, I think it might be referential to the title track, um, but I don't know. But having a picture of a cow on the front cover is, you know, you wouldn't see that nowadays. Especially since there's no there's no band name or album name. It's just, just a picture of a cow in the, in, in the grass. Um, but cows are, cows are cool, so no problem with that. Um... And I think the, this picture here is sort of Pink Floyd having a joke of their sort of faceless um, image. If you know what I mean, like, uh, they didn't like loads and loads of, uh, like, public exposure. They, 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 pretend, they preferred to go on stage and have big light shows and stuff like that. Sort of look at that while you're listening to the music instead of just looking at us standing playing, that sort of thing. Uh, until the wall became much more of a theatrical thing, I guess. But um, yeah, anyway, I'm Heart Mother. Five tracks on it. Uh, the first track takes up the entire first side um, on the vinyl version, obviously, CD. Um, six part suite. Uh, 
parts are Father Stout, Breast Milky, Mother Four, Funky Dong, Mind Your Throats Please, and Remergence. It's all instrumental, so I don't really know uh, if that has much meaning. Uh, I guess Pink Floyd, uh, there's, they're, they're instrumental tracks. Uh, they're early on instrumental tracks. Didn't have too much meaning to them. I think they were more just about the sound um, and more thinking about what it's about. But uh, it, Pink Floyd have said that they really, really don't like Adam Heart Mother, the track. I mean, uh, David Gilm I think David Gilmore performed it live with, uh, with some other people about 10 years ago. But I think Roger Waters, he hates it. I think he, he actually said in an interview that if somebody paid him a million pounds to play Adam Heart Mother, he'd be absolutely joking. Um, they said specifically it's the brass parts they don't like, but I actually don't mind the brass parts. Um, it is quite, uh, some of it can be a little bit uh, disjointed, some of it at times um, doesn't fit together too well. But um, all around, I think it's a decent decent 23 minute suite. Uh, I always forgot to mention, it's Pink Floyd's single longest track. A lot of people think it's Echoes because Echoes is a lot more famous, it's a lot more popular. Um, I've actually had to correct one or two people. Uh, Atom Heart Mother is about 12 seconds longer or something like that. Um, and of course, well, Shine On Your Crazy Diamond is the longest song if you put the two parts together, but they are two separate songs, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't count, count that. Uh, Shine On Your Crazy Diamond is one long song. Um, that would be 26 minutes if you added it all together, so instead of 13 and a half and 12 and a half, two parts. Um, well, it starts off, uh, well, I would say it's a psychedelic track. It's definitely a psychedelic track, but it definitely has that more sort of chill drumming you can hear it with the drumming when it goes do, 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 and the drums come in. Um, that was sort of the start of their more proggy sound that you'd hear in the the the, the albums upcoming after that. Um, there's some really weird psychedelic parts in it. There's some there's a wee funky bit, which is sort of a proto version, in my opinion, of this sort of funky bluesy bit in the uh, metal. I mean, uh, echoes, echoes. Sorry. Um, so I think it's just pure experimentation at my heart mother and I, I really admire them for doing that. Um, and this album was Pink Floyd's first album that apparently uh, I think they went to number one in the UK albums charts. Uh, and the idea of an album going to number one that half of it, uh, well actually way more than half of it, way more than half of this album is instrumental. Uh, I think only about 12 minutes or so, maybe 13 minutes. Uh, maybe 14 minutes of this album isn't instrumental uh, and about 36 minutes of the album is instrumental so the idea of an album like that going to number one nowadays is unthinkable unfortunately um you know but 1970 um people are a lot more open to that stuff um but uh, yeah there's really not much to say about atom heart mother the track uh, i haven't listened to it in a while um Again, it's not one of my favourite Pink Floyd songs. It's not one of my favourite instrumental tracks. It's not one of my favourite instrumental suites. Um, but I don't think it deserves as much hate as the band give it. Um, the fans seem to quite like it, but the band don't. And I don't think... I think the band... Um, uh, they, I think they've given it a bit too much hate. Um, I sort of like the, the sort of um, reprise at the end. I like the bluesy bit. Uh, I even like the sort of the singing, the sort of scat singing sort of going on, or, or whatever you, you would call it. Um, I like the sort of psychedelic keyboard bits. Um, but again, it's it's not fantastic by any means, but it's a, it's it's good. Anyway, the second side has obviously the rest of the album. Um, what they did here was they I think they had um, two songs bookend in the album, two instrumentals bookend in the album that were um, written by the whole band uh, and they had three short tracks that were written by Roger Waters, uh, David Gilmore, uh, no sorry Roger Waters, Rick White and then David Gilmore. Um, the first one of those three is F track two on the album, first track of side two uh, and that is a slow Roger Waters track where he's pretty much nothing but an acoustic guitar going on. Um, it's, it reminds me of Grandchester Meadows from Amagama, but not quite as good. Um, in fact, I'd say uh, nowhere near as good. 
I, but I really, really like Grandchester Meadows. I, I love that song. F is great, but I just not as good as um, Grandchester Meadows. Uh, again, not not too much to say about it. It's just a sort of slow um, acoustic track. Uh, Roger's lyrics are he's decent lyrics. Uh, he sings it well. Uh, but then track three, Summer of '68, maybe my favorite song on the whole album. Um, Rich, written by Rich, Rich, Richard Wright. Um, that has beautiful piano going on. Um, great lyrics, which is sort of describes. Um, I think someone is sort of this happy, happy psychedelic festival when he meets this girl, and uh, I assume he, he they end up having sex, and he he doesn't really know how to feel about her. That sort of stuff. Um, he starts thinking he'd rather be spending time with his friends and. You know, I, I quite like it, um, but again, it's the music that, that really matters, and there's some fantastic piano work on there, um, and it's it's one of the it's one of the only it's one of the only songs on the album that um, uh, well, out of the three out of the three uh, shorter uh, sung songs, um, well, all songs are sung, non instrumental tracks. Uh, it's the only one that sort of has a mix of all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, I don't know if the they're sort of brassy. There's sort of a brassy section going on. That I don't know if that sound was made with keyboard or uh, if it was actually used with real brass instruments. But it's pr maybe my favorite song on the album. If not, then another one I'll get to. Um, number four is "Fat Old Son," which was the David Gilmour uh, written track, which is seems to be the most popular song on the album. And I actually prefer both "F" and "Summer of '68." Um, I just don't like it that much, Fat Old Son. Um, I don't know what it is. Uh, I think at that point, David Gilmore was better when he was writing kind of darker stuff, like um, The Narrow Way from Amagama. I prefer The Narrow Way. Um, I don't think he, until his more slow, relaxing um, music writing came out, until songs like uh, A Pillow of Winds, which, correct me if I'm wrong, I think him and, Rogers, uh, him and Roger had co-written, co-wrote that one. Um... But I just don't like Fat. I just don't think Fat Old Sun's that great. Um, I think it's probably the weakest song on the whole album. Uh, sorry, David. Um, but uh, track five is Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast, which is a three-part, thirteen-minute instrumental suite, which uh, concludes the album. Which um, either that or Summer '68 is my favorite song on the album. Uh, it basically it's it's pretty funny. Um, it's basically just the sound of a guy waking up in the morning and getting his breakfast and he's thinking to himself and you know again I don't think it's supposed to have too much meaning it's more just about being psychedelic and you know sort of taking acid and tripping out that sort of thing Um, it's not really supposed to have too much meaning it wasn't until metal I'd say where Pink Floyd's lyrics really started to have real you know grounded meaning apart from uh, Richard Wright I think I think that people think of Roger Waters as the, um, as the one who wrote all the meaningful lyrics, and he was the main lyric writer from Metal Onwards, I think. But um, up until then, uh, it was all they all sort of wrote their own songs and they, they wrote the lyrics for their own songs. It was more of a moody blues sort of thing, where uh, like if someone wrote a song, then they would sing on it and write the lyrics. Um, but. Uh, up until then, I'd say Richard Wright wrote the best lyrics. Um, songs like Remember a Day, uh, again, Summer of 68, um, songs like that. Uh, but Roger, Roger and David, especially Roger, wrote some pretty good, good lyrics as well. Songs like Grandchester Meadow, um, Set the Controls for the Heart and the Sun. But I, there, there are other albums that I'll review uh, at another time. But uh, Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast is basically the sound sounds of a guy getting his breakfast in the morning and he's chomping down on his food and he's coughing and spluttering and sipping his coffee and it's it's pretty funny but uh, it's, again it's a three part suite uh, Rise and Shine, Sunny Side Up and Morning Glory are, my, are the three part names and uh, my favourite ones uh, either part one or two I'd say they're both just as good part one, sorry, part one is a beautiful little piano melody um, by Richard Wright absolutely fantastic uh, part two is a, an acoustic guitar part, which I assume was David Gilmore. Then part three is sort of um, sort of more straightforward, sort of rocky 
sort of going sort of similar to the more rocky parts of uh, Atom Heart Mother. Uh, and the whole thing takes place in this kitchen. So you hear him walk in the door, you hear him eat his breakfast, then you hear him leave. Uh, it's been called Pretentious. I think it's a bit of fun. Um, you know, they weren't they weren't taking themselves too seriously at that point. It wasn't until later on when they started to take themselves a wee bit too seriously. But that was sort of what Pink that was sort of what Pink Floyd's personality was about, you know. Um some prog bands took themselves really seriously, some didn't, and that's sort of what gave they gave them uniqueness. Um but all around, Atom Heart Mother is a very important stepping stone in the band's career. It moved away, like I said, it moved away from the more psychedelic stuff of the three previous albums or four previous albums. And moved and started to look more towards more uh, progressive stuff. Uh, well, traditionally progressive stuff, proggy stuff. Uh, the songs, uh, the songs started getting uh, longer. Though they did do long songs before that. Uh, the songs, uh, well, I guess maybe not longer, but not specifically longer, but um, more multi-part, more conceptual in a way. And you can very much see that on metal. Metal is when, metal in a way is sort of like Atom Heart Mother, but much better. You know, um, though I do I do really like Atom Heart Mother, but metal is better. I mean, let's let's, let's be honest. Um, so that this it was a very very important album in the band's history. Uh, a bit of an awkward transition, I guess you could say. Um, it was a transitional album that had had to be done. You know, they couldn't go straight from Amagama to metal. For anyone that really dislikes Atom Heart Mother, they couldn't go straight from Amagama to metal. Uh, it just, you know, bands, a lot of bands, so, you know, they need to transition, uh, especially, w and especially when they stay with the same band members. It's a little bit easier for bands like King Crimson to uh, completely change from album to album, like uh, Islands to uh, Lark's Tongues and Aspic, or red discipline because there's a big lineup change so different members are bringing in their own styles but if you get the same four members then it's a little bit more difficult to transition in a different style or maybe not more difficult but it takes a little bit longer and uh, Adam Heart Mother was the transition album uh, for Pink Floyd uh, from the more psychedelic stuff to the more progressive stuff that would uh, cause them to become the biggest band on the planet in the 70s probably and pro and maybe behind the Beatles probably the biggest band um in history probably uh, I would personally say I much prefer Pink Floyd to the Beatles um not a big Beatles fan uh, and, and amongst prog rock classicists is blasphemy apparently apart you ask any of the old prog guys uh, who's your favorite band they'll say the Beatles I personally don't like the Beatles that much there are some stuff I do like uh Tomorrow Never Knows is a good one it's probably my favorite one but all around um. Not a big fan of the Beatles. Um, anyway, that's Atom Heart Mother, 1970, uh, Pink Floyd, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, my review of it, and hope it was informative. Uh, what I'm thinking of what to review next. Um, again, if you want, if anyone wants to leave any suggestions, um, I'm thinking about maybe doing a tool one next. Maybe I should stop telling you what I'm going to review next and just leave it as a surprise. But um, actually, I think I might do something about movies next, or video games again, because I haven't done anything about uh, movies yet, and I haven't. Uh, the thing about Resident Evil, the video I did about Resident Evil, was less about the gameplay and less about the game itself, and more about the impact it has on me politically. Um, and another thing I, for I forgot to mention about Resident Evil 7 is they, re they released a DLC, which is downloadable content for anyone who doesn't play video games. Uh, that was totally free. Uh, the I am uh, the not a hero DLC was totally free. So if you add that to all the other stuff I said, it's like, were they trying to lose money? You know, a uh, very very lot of respect for Capcom what they did with Resident Evil Seven. But anyway, that's totally off topic. Pink Floyd, Adam Heart Mother re review number eleven. Um, not a fantastic album. Uh, above average. Um, some really 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 great moments, but all round. Not a fantastic through lesson the way albums like Dark Side of the Moon or Wish You Were Here are. Uh, important transitional album uh, in the band's history, but uh, and and in progressive rock, uh, and and you could probably the reason one of the reasons they probably transitioned into this album more uh, more progressive sound is because of in the Court of the Crimson King. If you notice, in the Court of the Crimson King came out in nineteen sixty nine, and a lot of other prog bands released their first albums that year as well. Genesis, Van der Graaff Generator, uh, 
Um, who else? Uh, yes, yes, released their first album in 69. Uh, a bunch of them released their first albums in 69. But they were more leaning towards the psychedelic side. But then when then the Court of the Crimson King came out in the same year, all those bands in 1970 who released their second album in 1970 it was much more the pro the proggy thing, uh, more s typical prog thing, and in the Court of the Crimson King is was very much uh, I'd say the culprit of that. No, not culprit. It was a good thing. It was very much uh, inspiration of Court of the Crimson King. I'd say that caused that. So that's so you can see how much of an important album it was. And I'd say Atom Heart Mother also followed that. Um, sure, Pink Floyd gave in the Court of the Crimson King a listen, and they were. Uh, impressed even if they've never specifically talked about it but anyway that's my review of Adam Heart Mother thanks uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, thanks for watching